Hello and good morning to you, my sweet friends. I'm so excited to be together doing my very favorite thing in the world. And what is that? Talking about our great big God together. Now, before we launch into our lessons and we get going too much, I wanna bring a little joy, make you laugh a little bit, so I have some jokes. Okay, the first one is, how do all oceans say hello to each other? They wave. <laughs> what did one wall say to the other wall? I'll meet you at the corner. <laughs> what do you call a bear with no teeth? A gummy bear. <laughs> this one's my favorite. What is brown and sticky? A stick. <laughs> All right, what kind of a room doesn't have any doors? What kind of a room doesn't have any doors? A mushroom. <laughs> Good ones. I hope it puts a smile on your face. Sweet friends, we are spending time together looking through our Bible and looking together at the miracles that Jesus performed while he was on earth. Okay, now last week we talked about four different things that make something a miracle. That's kind of how we look and see if this is really a miracle or not. Okay, let's go over them again. What is the first thing? Number one is miracles are always from God. Number two, miracles are against nature. As in, it doesn't just normally happen by itself. Right? Number three, miracles happen immediately, right away. And number four, miracles proved God is who God is. Now today we're going to be looking in the book of Luke. So grab your Bible and get ready. But first, I want to show you my shoes, okay? I'm gonna show you my shoes and I want you to tell me does it look like these shoes fit me? Hmm? Look at those shoes. Does it look like those shoes fit me? No way. They're way too big. These shoes are Mr. Josh's. Okay, okay, okay. Well, what about these shoes? Do, does it look like these shoes fit me? Hmm? No way! These shoes are way too small. They're Aiden's shoes. Have you ever heard the phrase um, that you should try walking in someone else's shoes before? Hmm? Now that doesn't actually mean put on somebody else's shoes. That's not quite what this saying is teaching us. What walking in somebody else's shoes is all about is think about how the other person might feel, right? Now empathy, empathy is a big word that is just the ability to understand what someone else is feeling. But compassion, Compassion takes it even further. Compassion is being concerned with the suffering for another, concerned with the heartache of someone else. It really means to suffer with another. Have you ever had someone be compassionate with you? Have you ever been compassionate towards someone else? Both are really great experiences. Now, the Bible tells us in Psalms 86, 15, that God is full of compassion, which means it's something that we should pay attention to if God is full of it. God understands what it means to suffer with us, suffer in this world, and God wants to suffer with us, have heartaches with us. Okay, I want you to listen for that word compassion as we read through our text. Are you ready? Let's go. You guys, I climbed up in my tree house to have Bible time together with you today. A nice quiet spot to talk about our great big God. We're getting ready to read our text from the book of Luke. But before we do, I want to make sure that you understand one of the important words that is inside of our text. It is the word widow, not window, widow. 
Do you know what a widow is? A widow is a woman whose husband has died. So as we read our text today, I want you to listen knowing that the woman in our story has already had a lot of sadness happen in her life. We are in the book of Luke. Is Luke in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Brilliant. Luke is in the New Testament. It is a gospel, which means it tells us about the birth, life, and death of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke the third book of the New Testament. Okay, are you there? We are looking for big number seven. Big number seven. And little number 11. Luke chapter seven, verse 11. Let's read together. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. Time out. How would you feel if you were this widow? Knowing from the word widow that she's already lost her husband, she is at a funeral for her only son. How would you feel? Keep those feelings on your insides as we keep going. Let's see what happens next. Time in. Verse 13. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Time out. How did Jesus feel when Jesus saw the widow? What we know is that his heart was overflowing with compassion and he went to comfort her, right? Is that along the lines of what you were thinking? When I ask you how you would feel if you were this widow, were you in, in, if you were there, what would you do? Is it kind of along the lines of what Jesus did? Have great compassion for her? Let's keep going. Let's see what Jesus can do. Time in. Verse 14. Then he, meaning Jesus, then he walked over to the coffin and touched it and the bearer stopped <clears throat> young man he said i tell you get up then the dead boy sat up and began to talk and jesus gave him back to his mother oh time out did you hear that Jesus just walked over to him and said, get up. And he did. And then Jesus gave him back to his mother. Oh, how would you feel if you were the widow, knowing that you thought you were going to bury your son today? And instead, here he is standing next to you. How would you feel? Time in. Verse 16. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. Boy, howdy, is that an amazing story. Did you hear the word compassion in there? Jesus stopped. He looked at the widow feeling her suffering, feeling the sadness in his own body from her heart. And he went to her and helped her with her sad heart by bringing her son back to life. Now, before we go too much further, let's go ahead and use our measurements to make sure this was an actual miracle. Okay, one, um, is bringing the son back to life from God. Yep. Two. Is bringing someone back to life who has died against nature, like it doesn't naturally happen? 
Um, yes. <laughs> Three, did it happen immediately? I mean, it says he got up and he gave him back to, Jesus gave him back to his mother, so yes. And four, did it prove God is who God is? Absolutely. I mean, it tells us that the crowd was whispering, did you see that? Did you see that? They had great fear and they praised God that a mighty prophet is among them. It proved that God is who God is. That's check box one, two, three, and four. Yep, I'd say and a miracle occurred that day. I have a book that I'm going to share with you this morning and we're going to read together that has a lot to do with compassion that shows up as an everyday miracle that we've been talking about. The book is Pog and it is written by Lynn Lee. Let's read together. Pog lived with his mom who was as busy as a dung beetle and his dad who was often away on mysterious business. There was Baby Bedlam, who didn't do much of anything yet, and Nana, who sat and talked to her pet potted plants. And there was his brother, Vandal. Pog was as brave as a bathtub full of sharks. He was afraid of nothing. Well, nothing very much. It was only at bedtime, when shadows played tricks on the eyes, that Pog grew nervous. Better check under your bed for children, crooned Vandal, and he softly laughed his wicked laugh. <laughs> I'm six and a half feet tall and older than I've ever been, said Pog. I am not afraid of anything. But he was. He was very afraid of children. Every night he checked carefully under his bed, inside the toy box, and behind the door. Then he would sneak up to his closet and wrench the door open. Everybody knows that's where children like to hide the most. He kept his nightlight on and pulled the covers tight under his chin until he fell asleep. When he woke up in the morning, he bounced out of bed full of bed bugs. Whew, he had made it through another night. When Pog started school, he had to walk with Vandal. I'm six and a half feet tall and older than I've ever been. I can walk to school by myself, Pog said to his mom. Not yet, she smiled. Pog's too little to walk by himself, crooned Vandal as they set off for school. I'm as brave as a bucket full of snails, said Pog and he stuck out his lip in a terrifying pout. I don't need you. What about children hiding along the way? Vandal growled. Pog was shocked. He thought children only came out when it was dark, like a night mist or a bad dream. Vandal grinned his wicked grin. They wait in the bushes until a little monster comes wandering alone, he said. Then they leap out and they peck you in a sec and they drag you away. So stick with me or you'll be in big trouble. <laughs> Pog stuck with Vandal all day. On their way home, they heard a whimpering and a wailing, a groaning and a moaning. Pog stopped. He grabbed Vandal. It's children, squeaks Pog. Children in the bushes. Don't be stupid, growled Vandal. There is no such thing. Vandal parted the bushes and there, stuck among some thorny branches, wide-eyed and wet, nose red and running, and mouth open in a black high-pitched wail was a child. Vandal went white with shock. He shook with fear, and then he fled down the road without looking back. Pog thought he must be dreaming. He stood and looked at the child. It was so small, so sad, and so damp that he couldn't be afraid of it. 
Who are you? asked Pog. What's wrong? My name is Tom and I'm having a bad dream and I can't wake up, said the child. Pog thought about this. You had better come home with me, he said. The family was flummoxed when Pog turned up with Tom. Mom cowered in a corner, clutching Bedlam to her breast. Dad thought Tom was a nightmare and tried to catch him in his net. Nana told Tom to get back to his pot. She thought he was a plant. And Vandal stood quivering and quaking, shivering and shaking. Pog said, he has to stay. I have to dream him away. Pog went to bed early that night. He didn't check under his bed or inside the toy box or behind the door. Instead, he told Tom to sit in the closet. Everybody knows that's where children hide, ready to jump out and scare little monsters, explained Pog. Pog fell asleep. He dreamed of children, children laughing in the playground, children playing in the sun, but he wasn't scared. He dreamed of Tom running home where his parents were waiting. When Pog woke up the next morning, he jumped out of bed full of bed bugs. He opened the closet door and Tom was gone. Pog was as brave as a barrel full of worms. I am six and a half feet tall and older than I've ever been, he said. And he was never, ever afraid of anything again. Well, not very much. Oh, I love this book. I love this book so much. But did you see the compassion in there, my friends? You never use the word compassion, but did you see it? When Pog found the child, he had to decide in an instant. His brother ran away scared and Pog had to decide what to do. Pog could have run away scared. Pog could have left him there alone. But Pog didn't. Pog had compassion. He let the sadness and the suffering and the scaredness of the child become his sadness. He suffered with and he took care of Tom and he found a way to get him back to where he was supposed to be. Now here's the other thing. At first they were afraid, right? And that's what the crowd says that, um, that's what the Bible says the crowd experienced after Jesus performed this miracle, right? They were afraid. And so what I want you to know is that fear can fuel us to do really good things, right? We talk about all the time how every emotion is from God and all the things that we feel are okay. They're all good. Sometimes that feeling of fear can spur us on to do acts of compassion or can spur us on to be awed and amazed. So don't run away just because you're afraid. Try and figure out what is the next right thing. It turns out that compassion is it's, it's a kind of an everyday miracle of its own, right? Jesus saw the widow, recognized her sadness and the ache of her heart, her grief, and Jesus helped. Now, I haven't just been listening to this story by myself. Sunday school lady has been listening too, and she has some things that she would like to say with us to us about compassion and everyday miracles. Okay, she has some advice for us. Well, hello, young whippersnappers. I've been around long enough to recognize that compassion is a huge part of living as a Jesus person. So we're going to practice some compassion that would be an everyday miracle in your own home. I'll give you an example and you tell me what would be the compassionate thing to do. A classmate trips and falls down during recess. What does compassion do? Hmm? Hmm? Compassion would help him get up. How about this? Your dad is frustrated about something at work. So what does compassion do? How about writing him an encouraging note? Your neighbor's dog runs away. 
compassion would help them look for their pet. Your brother steps on a toy and hurts his foot. What does compassion do? Not laugh at him. Compassion would help him clean up his toys. Your mom is tired after dinner. Compassion would help clean up the kitchen. A mailman delivers your mail in cold and rainy weather. Compassion would be making him a cup of hot cocoa. What about someone at the grocery store who knocks over cans of food? Compassion wouldn't laugh or stare. Compassion would help pick them up. Practice makes perfect, even with compassion. Now before I go, let's practice our memory goal together. You can be my echo. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God with us means we can be people of compassion. Go and practice this week. Thanks, Sunday School Lady. All right, friends, I climbed back in the treehouse. It's almost time for us to go today. But before we go, I want to pray with you. Now, here's the way we're gonna do our prayer time today. I'm going to start a sentence in our prayer and I want you to fill it in with what is on your insides, what your heart wants to say to God today. Are you ready? Let's pray together. God, you are great. God, you are good. Thank you for God, sometimes things are going really well and sometimes I'm struggling. Help me. We want to be people that are compassionate. God, give us eyes that see, give us ears that hear, give us courage to act. God, we praise you because you are We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a wonderful day, my friends, and a beautiful week, and I will see you next week. Bye. Bye, bye, bye.